and welcome back to the channel. Stephen Alson, Ronaldo, XG Files. How are you, Steve? Why are you, are you smiling? <laughs> this is not good news, mate. Do you know what? It, it's, not, it's not necessarily good news, but it's, it's news that you did say to me it's expected. It's, it is normal. Do you know what I mean? In terms of Joe, the Glazers somewhat being still within things that you'd, we don't want them to be involved in, which is yeah, basically Manchester United, like Manchester United Football Club. <laughs> for one. For one, for one. But obviously it has come out on the Financial Times. Obviously there's, there's further details that I haven't seen. I'm just reporting what the aggregators have put out, the aggregators. Um, and it's basically been put out and people have reacted with a lot of outrage initially, which is quite understandable. So what, Man United fans this week are just fuming. Yeah, just just It doesn't matter what comes out, so it doesn't matter. Mad. Just mad. So it doesn't matter at all. But the news is, Sir Jim Ratcliffe's proposed state for United would see Sir Dave Brailsford, I mean, that's a cycling guy, and Joel Glazer sitting on a committee overseeing football matters. The committee would be made up of two Ineos members and Joel Glazer. So he's a man minority in an extent there. But what does Joel Glazer know about football? I know this could, this is a temp, like obviously what people have further part is it's, it's a temporal thing. Eventually, Jim Ratcliffe will garner complete control, hopefully, of the football operations. But for now, the Glazers are still involved in things such, obviously, the commercial side. To of, a heavy degree, man. Like, he's got his sticky little fingers. Like, he, he arguably knows less than Ed Woodward. When what a great success he was, by the way. I think any time that I hear Ed Woodward, the one thing that I remember is, was it that thing? Was it, that kind of cringe thing he said after a signing? This signing's going to make everyone's hair stand up on the back of his neck. Cause I, I remember he, that clip. He, <laughs> you know he obviously did some sort of a course where they told him how to, to like deliver a one-liner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he loved a one-liner. And he was like, we can do things in a transfer market others can only dream of. Great line. Yeah. No, well, yeah, we, we've definitely wasted more money than any other team has wasted in the transfer market. Yeah, I don't know if they dream of that, but, you know, they, he absolutely loved a one-liner. Okay. Just did mad shit, like, going back from the very first tour he was involved. I'm going to go back and complete the Fabregas signing. <laughs> <laughs> Ed Woodward, gone, but still lingering. Still, I feel like got, oh, still got, like, about 2 or 3% shares, maybe 1%. He's got a percentage of shares. Still. still in the football club. Yeah. I feel like some of the damage that he did cause is still he, lingering. He's still involved in a decision-making level somewhere. Can we have the comments, please? And um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. I thought we completely got rid of him. No, we sacked him from his job, but I think he still has either an advisory or, or some sort of a capacity. Whatever. Yeah. But either way, like, yeah, so Joel Glazer, he's clearly, it, it's him and Avi that are the ones that won't fuck off. Yeah. And they're the ones that want to stick around for, for whatever reason. It's... They're the ones that want to play footy manager. They're the ones that want to um, have their hands all over this. But, you know, what evidence have they got that they know what they're doing? I mean, they didn't even buy the club. They was gifted it by the dad. The dad bought the club. Maybe they're just getting helped. These are know. the children of the know. man who bought it and he didn't have a fucking clue what he were doing. Exactly, because I know for some people that might be saying, oh, it, does, it doesn't matter, etc. but... It's, the article does also say that under the unconventional deal, Ratcliffe would acquire a 25% stake and assume effective control over all sporting decisions from managerial appointments to player signings. Okay, so that's obviously slightly a different narrative, but we can only go off what is the current situation. Assume effective control. We don't know when that's going to happen. Is it because, or is it still going to occur with Joel Glazer still? Well, the, the vote was today, right? So. The, vo the vote was meant to be today, but it's been delayed. Oh, right, okay. So I, I think the first thing that has to happen is there has to be a vote that actually accepts his offer. Okay. So Jim Radcliffe's offer is on the table at the moment. It hasn't been accepted. There is an expectation it is accepted, but until it's done, it ain't done. Uh, and then obviously you've, you've got news about how it might get carved up in terms of the responsibilities on the other side. Gary Neville correctly asking, how does a minority stakeholder influence the culture and running of a football club you know so dave brailsford and the marginal mm. gains guy you know it, that might be one way of doing it but ultimately so dave brailsford I, as far as i'm aware isn't a football guy he's a cycling guy cycling is a linear skill guess what get stronger get mm. faster get more endurance get a lighter bike you go faster <laughs> there's no equivalent in football it's a cultural thing it's a, a tactical thing okay it's a different sport like some sports, you just like, and American sports in particular are very good at this, where you go, can we get quicker, stronger, heavier, faster? And that literally changes results. Mm. 
that doesn't have as football is such an open sport like what's the best close sport I can think of 100 metres running or uh, swimming something like that right you, nobody else touches you you're not competing against other human beings in a physical sense you might start but they're not interfering with you Football is a 100 metre race where you've got to control a ball, the weather, and there's people actively trying to stop you running the race. Like, you can't treat it the same way you can, can treat um, some very closed sports. It's mm. an open and creative sport, and it's one of the reasons that we love it as a sport. It, it, it's, it's similar to MMA in a sense where it's, there's so many ways to win and so many ways to succeed and lose mm. that you can't just apply Formula One tactics to it. You can't apply the same sports science that you have in cycling to it. You can't just go, we'll do this. You can probably get some improvements by thinking along the way they do in other sports, but you have to, to get better at football, you've got to get better at football. Simple. <laughs> to get better at football, you got to get better at football. Yeah, and just as get mental as that sounds. It, 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 it does sound a bit, but I do get what you're saying. But um, on the face of it, I think there's a lot of questions. Well, say I can't see these comments. Can someone move them where I can actually read them? This article's also meant to be given a few answers in terms of what's doing what. But until it's actually officially agreed, do we know for sure? Because it also has been reported that United's commercial operations will remain under the Glazers' control although Surgeon Ratcliffe as a large shareholder on board director would command some influence. One source said that Jim Ratcliffe is aiming to make a mark quickly on the pitch to signal to United fans that despite the Glazers remaining as majority owners, his arrival would represent a break from the past. He's, you know I mean? He has to do that, right? Jim Ratcliffe almost needs to come in and not get the Glazer stank on him. Yeah. Because already for a lot of fans... He is enabling the Glazers. He has invested money, paying money to the Glazers. That money ain't going to the club. Let's have it right. That money's going straight to the, the shareholders and the mm. Glazers to, to do whatever they want with. That money, that 1.5 billion he's putting into the club ain't going to buy a new fucking set of napkins in the gaff. So that money he's putting in, is he's buying his way into controlling. The club don't benefit from that investment at all. So for a lot of people... Uh, here's, here's a couple of instances of what's going on. One is he isn't the sugar daddy from Qatar or, or, or the sugar daddy at all. Um, <laughs> right, I'm going to come up with some of these super chats because some of these are mental. Um, <laughs> people wanted the sugar daddy from Qatar. Yeah. They didn't get the sugar daddy from t Qatar. Every other idea is a bad one, right? Hmm. Now, that might not be wrong. It might be a bad idea for Sir Jim. Like, that might be out of the frying pan into the fire. We don't know. Do you think a lot of the um, the want for the whole sugar daddy, quick success kind of thing has been, as the reason why United fans have kind of, well, a lot of them have kind of catered towards the whole Jassin proposal was obviously the quick fixes in terms of the debt, but also looking at where our rivals are going under yeah, their regimes and, and we'll being worried I, I about being I, left I, behind. Yeah, I think people are, um, and maybe rightly so, right? If Sheikh Jassim goes and buys Liverpool... Or Tottenham. That's extremely problematic for us. And that doesn't excuse the... the you know, the people... You know, that doesn't make the... The fact you would be state ownership more palatable just because... Oh, well, if, uh, if he don't get someone... You know, I mean, it's like... That doesn't necessarily excuse the the, sh mm. the state ownership angle for me. That oh well, you know, they'll buy somebody else and then we'll just get left behind. I, I think um, I think it's a massive looking across the pond, looking across at Newcastle, looking at City, looking at where you could go next. Even looking at the likes of Todd Booley, not state owned but absolutely mental and not not holding back the checkbook in the slightest. United have never had that. You've never had that. Despite the fact we've spent a billion on players in the last 10 years, so what? We spent more than that on debt. We could have spent twice as much on players if we wanted. The club made that money. Without anyone putting a penny in, the club made enough to spend twice as much on players. And how much did Glazers get, um, United? Was it, was it 750? What was it? 660 million, I think. And that was borrowed. They ain't paid that back. We did. 
and they was going to walk away potentially with a billion each in Say their pocket. Say what you pocket. want about, I know the Glazers in terms of what they've done for the football club, but from a business perspective of what they've done for themselves, fuck it, you know. It's, it's a robbery. They've it's legalised robbery. They've had a right coup there, you know. It's legalised <laughs> robbery. It, in, an, in another way of, of carving it up, it'd be embezzlement. It would be embezzlement. Mm, if you carved way. it up a different way, it would be called embezzlement. Can you show me those super chats, please? So we've got one. Um, there we go. We've got Christopher James says, Steve, I've written a 6,000 word email to shake Jassim, asking for him to make one last attempt to save us. No news yet. We'll keep you updated. I don't know if that's parody or not. I don't know if that's parody. Number one, I want to know how long that took you. Number two... How did you get his email address? Is another question. Do you know what I mean? Is it shake.jassim at gmail.com? <laughs> or is it Jassim Althani at email? And th- Imagine it is. And three, have you been cheating on Pepsi with a rival? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Coach Zach says, off topic. Oh. Okay. I got a letter. What's everyone writing letters? What year is it? I got a letter from a player uh, coaching the under 16s uh, thanking me for what I've done for the team this year and basically saying I reignited passion for the sport. Best feeling ever. Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. Yeah, that is what coaching is all about when you get feedback like that. They'll never forget you, though. That kid. <laughs> um, Fergal says, is it possible to think the f- is it possible to think the fact not a massive lot changes with Sir Jim Radcliffe is a good thing? Slight cash injection, uh, more football people in place, um, but Ten Hag can focus on the future because they'll have job security. Ten Hag's job security, yeah, you're probably correct on that. Mm. I hadn't finished reading that, but okay. Um, <laughs> I know. What was the rest of it? I was, what was, what was the <laughs> as we went? No, nah, that was, that, I feel like that was, uh, that was the rest. Of, that was all of it. No, well, a, a slight cash injection. I'd, have we had a cash injection? Um, I don't think anyone's mentioned a cash injection, have they? I don't think the cash injection. They talked about redoing Old Trafford, and then they was like, mm, yeah, maybe not actually. I think the cash injection he's referring to is the, the amount that Jim spent. Yeah, but they ain't seeing that money. That's going right past them into the pocket. Oh, Glazers, and they spread it out, saying, "You know what? We'll stay majority control." Of. It's absolutely. Do you know what's, how much is it that um, Chelsea was bought for? Was it around four four bill? Four bill, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <sighs> Jesus. And supposedly United was worth three point three, which I get why the Glazers would want more, but the fact the Glazers aren't taken into account is the stadium needs mm. immediate work. The land value of Old Trafford is not that of like land in Chelsea, which will be significant portion of what they're it, Was it not six bill plus the amount that they would have spent to wipe off the debt and invest in a stadium? But people have rightly said, why the fuck would the Glazers care about yeah, that? Yeah, Glazers didn't care about that. But it was also yeah. um, clearing the debt, which they, they obviously they, the last 18 years have shown us they don't go fuck about that either. Yeah. They don't, really don't care about it. Glenn says, so Jim will always think of the Glazers because his nose is so far up their holes. I think that's a little bit unfair we don't for know, now. We don't know that fully yet. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's correct at the moment. I mean, that might be the case. But right now, he gets a clean slate yeah, we'll to see. see what happens. If he just saddles up with them and then starts taking dividends out, then fuck this guy as well. But until mm. then, open mind. I think everyone deserves a, 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 and everyone deserves you to judge them from their actions, not from the actions of those that they're uh, either replacing or whatever. Yeah. Owen with a super chat says all this because of a horse. I don't know how much of it is because of the horse. Is that because of the, the, the oh yeah, the Fergie thing. thing with the horse and the... Um, is all this because of fucking Murdoch in, the, in 98, 99? We should have we bought a club then when it was semi-affordable to fans because now it's 10x the price. You, you ain't never getting a... The fans will never own it. Imagine that though. I don't know what would have happened though. But on, on the flip side of it, with us obviously United going down the route of minority ownership with Jim Ratcliffe hoping to get an eventual majority share and not got, gone down the route of the sh- sugar daddy, Sheik Jassim. If this does end up working for United, because United is big enough to do that and generates enough revenue generally, if somehow we do kind of surge back to the top, challenging these other state-owned football clubs like a City or, or a Newcastle, wherever they are then, wouldn't that be still some sort of great thing for football? In what is becoming, especially with the way the Saudi Arabian Pro League's going, where the football is becoming more and more 
to do like I was about to say more and more dodgy, but I feel like it it, it was it's anyway. Not dodgy, it was, not think, dodgy, but I more like towards the whole like cash influxes from the the likes of Saudi Arabia and Qatar and these countries that have the cash. I, I think dodgy would be unfair, yeah. but um, yeah, the the money involved for a while has taken out a little bit of the sport and the magic yeah. of it. And people will absolutely start commenting, especially opposition fans. United are the worst for it. Well, we're not. I mean, never have been um, at all. So I don't know where you, you you change that narrative that's already out there. Um, mm. You know, we we never been the people that spent the most. We spent consistently over a longer period than other clubs because we've you know had the success which led to it. But all of that money was club generated. There has never been someone who just gifted United what Chelsea got. Um, Roman, you know, what Roman got, you know, United have have made that money. We, ne like we or even like what Blackburn had. The reason Blackburn was successful in the nineties was because they had an owner who um, was making a fortune selling steel and just put it straight into Blackburn, and they 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 went bananas on the record uh, on record transfers as well. The likes of Shearer and Sutton and, and people like that. And United have never had that. We've competed with that mm. always, but we've never had that. Uh, we never got any credit for that either. You know, a large homegrown thing. And actually, people dismiss, like, yeah, you didn't spend a lot because you had the class of 92. What? Yeah. Like, that's not a negative. <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, so, yeah, like, it, it's a difficult situation uh, to be in, I guess. No, it, it, it is for sure. But I think that's the one silver lining. That is, if, if there's one club that can still obviously challenge on a financial standpoint, I know we are struggling with the debt, etc. Just with stuff going the right way and and staying within uh, what people are saying soul do you know what I mean whatever soul is actually left in football anyway these days but um i worry for what not because it's it's not because it's saudi arabia but because of the obscenity of how it's gone off in saudi arabia where the pro league's looking something serious do you feel like it'll have the same type of burnout the, the russian league the chinese league they'd have or no I, I think this this could stick around forever Mate, they got so much money that it's unlimited, essentially. And it, but it's becoming more and more like obviously Ruben Neves won their prime years. <sighs> Do you know? Because for the the, it seems like to be like people that are past their peak, going there in the later stages of their career. I think when they start enticing players that are in the prime is when it'll be of a concern. They did sign Ruben Neves, and they've signed Gabby Vega from um, Celta Vigo, who was like an ex upcoming star in Spain. Um. I think those kind of signings are the worrying ones. But from the flip side, why couldn't people around that age of 22, 23, when they're really good players, could they not want to go to the Saudi Pro League to have two, three years to make as much dosh as possible and then try and come back? Or will the le that level of football in that league, spending two years in there, make them not feasible to come back and play in a better level of competition? I would say in the 90s... Um Italian football was the best. Yep. And Italian football also paid the most. Who beat it? In the... Who what, beat it? In the nights. Where, where, where did all the money go? England. Yeah. Um, and then England became the best. Okay. I would say... What, what could happen... Um, and on one hand, it'd be sad if, if this happened because I'm seeing Europe becoming less competitive. I remember when United drew Honved, right? Yeah. In 93, uh, 93, 94. And it was a panic. Oh, my God. Tough mm. game this will be, especially away from home. Like, you've mm. got to try and get a bit of a result there. We beat them at home. You get the likes of Galatasaray. And, and you know, we went out to Galatasaray. You get those sorts of games. Proper. You know, yeah. And you're like, Check. oh... Turkey's if you're that, if you're yeah, that, yeah. it ain't that no more because the money's saturated now to the big two or three leagues. Like, who's good in Europe, really? La Liga and English teams and Bayern. And that's about it, really. Ain't nobody in Italy really gets to fuck with anyone at the moment. I know people Nap go, Nap Inter, Inter got to the final last year. Napoli. Yeah. Napoli had, a, think they were winning it? Napoli had a year of being unbelievable last season. This season, they're already not as good. You're never you know getting I mean? two or yeah, three sustained. Yeah. Same with yeah. France. Like, you're not. Five, six years ago, you might. Paris went all right. Monaco did all right. You're not getting those... Mold, you, you get an outlier. You don't get, like, a sustained. Like, where's, where's into this year? Are they going to do anything? No, right? You're not getting a team that can come and 
sit at that, that top table. That was meant to be Juve, AC Milan. Yeah, it, th- that don't happen no more. And and the downturn in Italian football in that instance has been largely down to fine. Largely financial though, has it? Like you well, have said. Italian football really fell off when people found out it was corrupt. When people found out referees were being bought and league titles were being bought. And then I completely people understand by it. The, uh, yeah, because you go. Mafia. Yeah. So from that moment, the crowds stopped going. The crowds stopped going. One of the things is, even from TV, as a spectacle when you're there in person, you need the crowd. Mm. No one's ever been to a great game with 38 people. It's never happened. <laughs> like, the crowd is as much of a part of the spectacle as f- of football as the football going on on the pitch. It mm. just is, right? And one of the reasons why the Premier League captured the imagination is even back in the 90s, the, the crowds were full. And, and it, the crowds were having it. Whereas you go to Italian football, it didn't really sell out week in, week out. The big games didn't. It did look incredible. But your, 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 you know, your mid-table games, they didn't sell out. They was half mm. empty. So you can't really put them on TV and get the same buzz that you get. You go and put Villa Fulham on. It'll be rammed. And the crowd's having it. Yep. You, know, you put Crystal Palace on, whoever they're playing, and that crowd is having it. Stockport versus Salford. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and the... The crowd played a massive part in um, the spectacle that we saw. Now, you might start getting the crowds in Saudi Arabia if they can improve the tourism and this, that. No, you're asking a hell of a lot. That was going to be my next point of view. I thought the only issue with Saudi Arabian football is will they be able to generate enough fans there and crowds there? And It won't be hardcore, though. It will be very transient and very tourist. And you're saying tourism, (sighs) it's a costly place to go. I don't know, because we, we, we did the World Cup in Qatar, right? And obviously there were quite a bit of fans there, f- as much as you thought they could be. People save up for a lifetime to go to a World but Cup. But honestly, from what I could garner from the fans that were there for all the nations in Qatar, they were all a specific type of people, do you know what I mean? If you get what I'm saying. I feel like it, it just looked like people that didn't all look like proper fans. A lot of them did look like people that can just afford to go. I don't know if that's like, like a class issue. Well, it, but a million percent is because is Qatar was an expensive as fuck place. The World Cup tickets were expensive as fuck. Yeah, it didn't feel the whole like... Because football is a work, working class sport and it didn't... It sometimes like, That's where a lot of the passion and that comes from in it. And it's, I, it didn't really have that vibe at the Qatar World like, Cup. Do you know where's, what I mean? where's the place that you'd want to go to for atmosphere now? South America, all day. Eastern Europe, Turkey. all day. Northern Africa, all day. Yeah, Turkey. Where... What what have those things got in common? But it's still a working class sport, and you're they still getting a, a young football, crowd. Yeah. Premier League crowds. They did a study, right? They did a study in the early nineties, and then they did a story twenty years later. So I want to say it was like ninety four, ninety five, mm. and then two thousand four, two thousand five, something like that. And the average age of the season ticket holder at United had gone from like twenty four to forty four in twenty years. So what does that tell you? It's the same crowd. Now, you're not going to see 45-year-old lads ballooning and having it and this and that. You might see some, and they've got problems that they need to speak to someone about. But for the most part, the people that are, are ballooning and having a buzz should be 18 to 23. You know, they've gone in beard up, they've gone overboard, they've had a bit too many, they're a bit leery. That's who the, the noise should be coming from. As you graduate and get older, you should move into like the side seats, like North Stand, South Stand. You should sit down and you should have a fucking brew as you're watching the game and, and chill out a little bit more. The Premier League has priced out the bell ends. Some people will say for good. For atmosphere-wise, it's not for good. But the reason you still get it in South America and Eastern Europe and Turkey is because the prices are cheap enough. The tickets are unallocated and you can still go and have it with the lads. And that is what... I don't think you're going to see in Saudi. And you you started to lose. You can still get a great atmosphere in the Premier League. But it's older. It's an older crowd than it ever has been because of the price of tickets. Uh, and the, what was the point I was trying to fucking make on this? Is that the Premier League took away from Italy. It's took away from France. It's took away from Germany. It's took away from Holland. Imagine being an Ajax fan. At one point, Ajax was winning Champions Leagues. Like... They was a force. They could bring homegrown talent through like a Cruyff, uh, like Kluivert's and Sadoff's and Van der Sars, and they can go and win European Cups with them. They don't get the opportunity to do that now. I mean, they went close recently. 
but they'll they get them stripped off them. They get one. They're another outlier. They get one little bit of a run to a semi final, something like that. They get stripped. Same with like a Porto, or or another team from you know, a, a so called smaller nation. Now you you mm. you'll get ripped to pieces by Barcelona, Real Madrid, by the Premier League, maybe by Bayern Munich and that as well, or Paris if you if you're in France. It's becoming so distilled into who gets to compete at the moment that I can see Saudi taking that. The way you saw an influx of people go to China and then it fell apart because China weren't paying. And China changed the rules and said, actually, we, we just want to do homegrown. America, the competition wasn't level wasn't there. And also the pay wasn't really there. There was some good pay, but it certainly wasn't Saudi level pay. Saudi are going, how much you earn in England? A lot. And what, Five exit. Football might be the fourth sport in America, maybe. I don't know. I think the MLS has done well so far. And I think it's it's here to stay. In a, and it, it's the ma- it is a major sport now. But it's not one of their go-tos. I don't think it's culturally ingrained in America, but it's the most played by kids. Most played by kids. And I think also that's big. I think that's a big thing. Middle class. Definitely. See, that's the weird thing is in America, it is a middle class sport, whereas the rest of the world, it's working class sport. Yeah. It's inner city, it's it's blue collar, whereas in America, it seems to be very much... The, how do I explain this? In England, Sunday league means rough. Yeah. You know, that's what you grow up playing for most people, right? You grow up playing Sunday league. It means shit pitches, shit facilities, changing in a... In a, in a a breeze block building with a broken window. You know, it, it means like lines on a pitch that you can't see. It means a fucking referee that's terrible. You know, it, it means someone's dad is the coach. You haven't got a team bus under tens. Hmm. You haven't got uh you haven't got two balls that are the same brand. You know, this kid's not even got the same kit on as everybody else. Like it means it's it's cheap and nasty in a way, but that's our culture. In America, I when I think of American soccer for juniors and grassroots, I think people turning up in SUVs. I, I think of um, forty odd year old mums with highlights. I, I think of people getting out their own chairs to sit down there. I think of it being very polished in ex- exclusive facilities in suburbs. It, it doesn't feel to me like it's in a city. Like we drove through Williamsburg in New York, right, when we mm, was in America. Yeah. There's basketball courts. Yep. That's what I think of. I think that is their grassroots exactly. inner city on TV, sport. Like inner city, basketball courts, parks, people in like full of kids, full of people. The only place that's yeah. different is Venice Beach. Venice Beach has got a pickup game. Yeah. Venice Beach FC have got a pickup game in Los Angeles where that's mm. becoming a culture in there. Now, obviously, they've got a lot of Hispanic culture in, um, in Los Angeles as well, which might be a big driver for that and maybe the the latin culture in america has been a massive driver for football slash soccer yeah over there. they do i think quite a majority of um, and latin america seems to be a majority of mls, MLS players well. do seem to be like the homegrown latin descent like mexican latin i think there's a lot of that when it comes to football there but it is it is true but still in the day i feel like football in america is still behind the nba the nfl probably baseball do you know what I mean? It's not something that's really at the forefront of, of American sport in general. But when I go back to the, the Saudi Arabian um, league, I think there's still a bit of it that makes you feel like it won't stick for, for good. I don't know. When I, obviously, we saw Just how, some of the investment in Qatar. You know how quickly Saudi, the, 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 like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the Middle East, they are very, pri- they are very proud people. I do think where, if it doesn't go as quickly or as well as they want it to over the next couple of years, I'll just be like, yeah, fuck it. Look how fast they got involved with F1. Yeah. And look how fast they got involved with uh, the golf thing with Saudi Arabia. Look how fast they've become a destination for heavyweight title fights in boxing. Yep, oh yeah. I, I think you're mental if you think this is, is flashing the pan. I, I think this is here to stay. Uh, I think I, I think Project Mbappe is very much gonna become fucking Project, Project Al Aleti, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Th- it depends. Would does it ever rival English football, Premier League football, like yeah. La Liga? I-, I think five years of what's going on right now, and it's surpassed it. Now, whether it's surpassed it from um, a cultural impact, whether it's surpassed it from 
the the sale of TV, whether it surpassed it from um, the the in stadium atmosphere and crowd. I, I think that's all up for debate. But I think in terms of you're a young kid coming through at Marseille, yeah, and Barcelona come in for you, and fucking Al Nasser come in for you. I think in five years' time, if they continue the way they're going, I think you probably go and I think ultimately it will lead to like Saudi Arabia being in the UEFA Champions League the bigger payday the bigger yeah or I I don't know how much of this was do you know what we want a European Super League if they do the thing is World Super League if, if the Saudi League does come into the UEFA Champions League do they then have to abide by UEFA rules yeah but by then they might be making enough revenue because here's the thing it's all linked to revenue right because what they're doing now is the the is driven by the fact that they can do what they want because they don't have to abide by FFP. Correct. So so they might um they're powerful enough that they could go like well we're coming in but we're not going to fuck with FFP and the, and the leagues might go okay because we want to see all of these Ballon d'Or winning players and stuff they might do it. Are you saying UEFA wouldn't do what makes them the most money? Of course they will. Probably. I mean, or would FIFA allow it? by that point they might have their TV rights might be through the fucking roof and they might be like well, we're actually making a profit now <laughs> which you go oh how are they making a profit when they're paying Amar fucking yeah. how many million a month look at who they can just sponsor <laughs> they just go yeah you're sponsored by PGA Golf now for six bill a year crack Jesus on Christ. you're sponsored by the um, what's it the F1 um, yeah the F1 so track sponsors, F1 track sponsors, sponsors this you. team and they're paying a billion a year, shut the fuck up. Um, it's all City did with Etihad. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly the same. Exactly so if he's, he's all right here, he's not all right there. Well, you can't make your mind up like that. Um, Owen Thompson with a super chat there says, truth is the right people uh, being involved, we'd be there with Madrid based on our revenue, two clubs that don't need any state ownership. I, I agree with that. Uh, Fergal says, you ever see James Alcott doing a phone-in? Imagine the chaos if we did. Would be cool though. Um, well, we used to do a phone-in, and those who pay attention know why we don't. Uh, Christopher says, he's the chairman of the Islamic Bank. There's a contact email available. It's worth a try, no? I mean, mate, yeah, I mean, if you want to write a 6,000-word no email. Is doing that? Well, I don't know that? what that means. Also, no Patsy Klein's involved, Ronnie Lad. I, I don't know the reference. I think he's a uh, Ray says, Snickers. Joel Glazer's <laughs> overseeing United operation. Worrying the fuck out of me, Joel Glazer's shocking at football. Uh, Reese says, seen the French League, uh, no new... No new streaming, streaming sponsors. sponsors. What does that mean? I think they're saying that no new TV money. TV money's not not there for the French league. I can see, like, uh, yeah, and ultimately, yeah. like, look, didn't did did Scottish TV rights go for a million recently or seven million? I feel like it was something like that, and you think this is before Rangers came back into the league. So just when it was just Celtic, just turning up. To be fair, I I thought it would have been. I thought the Scottish league or the SPL would have had to have paid people to watch. To be honest. <laughs> the best thing that might happen right. to Scottish football would be if the League Cup got scrapped and it was called the, I don't know, the, the League of Britain Cup, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you you invite the combined TNS with, team, TNS and all with Wales. Like from Wales. Um, you get some of the boys over from Northern Ireland, or even you get the Irish teams in as well, because that'd be some high level competition. Yeah. Uh, and they're still getting smoked by the likes of Villa and, and people like that, but I, see, I think bro. it'd be a good thing. Jesus. I think that'd be a good thing. Um, Sam says, I'm happy Qatar bid faltered like Chelsea state like Chelsea. Uh, state owned or associated clubs vulnerable to political shifts. City and Newcastle not immune to it. They're not, but I think the the Chelsea power behind state. those people just arguing because of him beating Russia. Yeah, yeah, well yeah. they yeah. I mean yeah. I mean ultimately, yeah, I don't could someone <laughs> still explain that one to me? I don't know. Don't know how it works with Roman, Chelsea, Russia. Uh, Happy says, uh, great to see you lads, like always. Uh, do I think Sir Jim will get a good reception in the stadium? Hmm. Actually, that's a very good question. I really don't know. I don't know. Yes and no. Depends on what happens when the details, the fine details come out by the time he does find himself in the crowd or at the stadium. Because that, that could be very telling. I think he, if he's a smart man, he'd, he would know not to do a whole pitch walkout, but I feel like the club would probably encourage it. I don't know. Because I, I can, I can only envisage as he's walking onto the pitch. All you can hear is Glazers out, Glazers out, Glazers out. And he's and he responds. What else is it going to be? And he responds. 
If he goes like, ah, give me time. Give me five. Give me five minutes. Nah, <laughs> there's no way. There's no way that's a sensible idea. Yeah. If you're thinking about that, lads, don't. Nah, don't. Uh, right, you might no. notice this on the background behind us. You're thinking, what the hell is Tentray? What well, is, wait, what is Tentray? Go on, well, let me know. We've also got mugs. You like them? Um, roll VT, and we'll explain a little bit. A little bit of an announcement then for you guys. Ten Trade and my channel are going to be working together. You might have already seen them working with the football team. That was a, a vote that was passed by all the members. And if you think I've lost the plot, why am I working with a, a trading company? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I like what they're about. And it's about education, finance, uh, and all that sort of stuff we don't know enough about. And I think that there's a, a massive lack of education. And I think that allows some people to take advantage at times. So I'm all about educating people i'm all about people finding their own way and 10 trade have got the ability to do that they've got something called 10 academy they've laid everything out it's the basics to the nitty-gritty details they've got courses expert sessions guides you name it they've got it whether you're just peeking around the door or whether you really want to dive into the deep waters and figure trading out there's definitely something for everybody if you're interested then check the link out below and start a bit of an educational journey today Right then, if you'd like to find out more about 10Trade um, on the XG files, and I do a video called This Week at Paddock where I go behind the scenes about running the football club, we're going to be delving into some of the things that they do and some of the, the platform and courses that they, them guys offer because I don't know anything about it. I'm not going to sit here and pretend I'm an expert, but I'm going to use the tools that them guys have got to try and learn a bit. Now, someone's just commented, I've just lost the name, and said, have you seen the leaked board... Uh, meeting memo for today mate it was the most obvious parody in the world and i can't believe you fell for it so i'll read it out it's honestly i can't believe you fell for this so it's got all the people that are involved joel glazer executive co-chairman and director uh, cliff batty chief financial officer and director it's got patrick stewart and it says legal officer General Counsel and Commander of the Star Trek fleet. For that might have been able to give it away for you, but I guess it didn't. Then it's got the agenda, credit and financials. Half an hour, Joel Glazer. It's got women's facilities, Richard Arnold, talking about it for one minute. Then it's got roof maintenance, Patrick Stewart, talking about it for two minutes. Then it's got four minutes, talking about the Ginsters partnership uh, for 35 minutes. And then it's got... Uh, so Jim Ratcliffe's offer, Avram Glazer, Put start on time, table. one minute, and then to be announced. <laughs> it was obviously parody, mate. Like, come on. It was clear <laughs> parody, wasn't it? Like, I can't believe he's a fell for that one. Oh, come on. To be fair, I thought that was quite believable. Oh, hang on. I asked you missed the best bit. Arnold's condition for attending, where was that? Oh, it says, is there a buffet? Uh, <laughs> come on, man. Sure, um, depending on who you are, I think buffets are a scam. Do you know why? I think it's a mental game for me. Every time that I've attended a buffet, I feel like I've, I've end up eating around the same amount that I would have eaten just as a restaurant ordering a two course meal. Do you remember Red Hot Buffet in town? Yes, I do. That, that's exactly the one I'm referring to. So Red Hot like Buffet in town became yeah. a thing for a minute. Yeah. yeah. Like every, people was like, selfie themselves got red up buffet you couldn't move on social media for people going to red up buffet and i am anti-hype like if everyone's going somewhere i ain't going there out of thing and i think we ended up going there for someone wanted to take i think i feel like it was someone's birthday or something ended up going there and then i went to where at red up buffet and joe the only good thing there was <laughs> the bread that was okay. it the meat was wet it was yeah. just like wet meat um Every single thing I got disappointed me. And yeah. the way people go on about it, uh, I don't even know if it's open anymore. I can't imagine it's still open anymore. It, you know what it is? Buffet, buffets just play on humanity's greed. Because mentally you're just like, oh, more food, as much food as I want. Almost feel like you're not paying for it when you are. <laughs> and realistically, all it is, is bu buffet, is it's food that's probably not cooked with the same amount of care as you would if you went to a normal restaurant. And two... I think your eyes end up being a little bit bigger than your stomach and you actually end up having, what, what a plate and a half? Well, I'm just being myself, a plate and, or, or two plates at most and you're full anyway. So it defeats the whole purpose. Ashton used to have a Chinese that was, was shit, but it were good. 
<laughs> if that makes any sense. Like, it weren't high quality, but there was some stuff that they did that was, like, really, really tasty. But you knew it weren't high quality, but you didn't go for that. Um, there was a Chinese that I went to in Andover um, that was so fucking good. And yeah. I never got anything like that. That's the only buffet that I've been to where I was like, oh, wow, that was actually really, it was like a tenner or something. <laughs> it was so good. Oh, fuck you. Uh, Matty Jones said, I went to Red Hot Buffet and ended up leaving and going and getting a Burger King. Uh, Jeff says, uh, MLS except for <laughs> local rivalries is not well attended here in Dallas, uh, but packed in for Austin and Houston. IR says, never left a buffet and not had to subsequently spend an hour on the toilet. <laughs> so that, yeah, it's, that's, that's, I guess if, you, um, if you're constipated, then go to buffet. Um, Sam says, all you can eat buffets used to be a big thing in the States. Uh, fell out of favour pretty hard. Joe, you know, people were telling us when we was at um, Caesar's Palace that, oh, Caesar's Palace buffets. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I had a look at it once and I was like, actually, I'm going to be honest with you, the standard of food in America bar about two gaffes was awful. It wasn't that good. But I, when I, what I did enjoy, um, if it, in and out Burger was good. Yes, in and out Burger is a good burger. I think it might actually be above five guys. No, nah, I disagree. In and Out Burger was good, but also the um, the ta the taco place in San Diego. See, I, I thought that would be a lot better than it ended up being. It was fine. It was it okay. wasn't it wasn't like get me there again in the morning. Yeah, it was okay. nice, but it wasn't like wow, this has blown me away in any way. Um, there was uh, the place in Jersey, the diner that we had in Jersey. I don't know if you were with us for that one. We had in a diner in Jersey. Was that the 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 night before we left? Was that no? That was in Vegas. There was a di that was a nice place. Okay. That was that was uh, Bugsy Siegel's place. Yeah, yeah. That was nice, considering it was dead. It's the wrong part of town. It's yeah, yeah, it's the wrong part. part. Of town. Uh, but that was, there was literally nobody else in the restaurant. That was a nice place. And there was uh, Crush. Um, <laughs> it was the day that I had a fucking paddy and didn't want to speak to anyone. <laughs> and I yeah. was like, I'm fucking done. This place can fuck off. And uh, I, I was saying to Janine, like, I'm just trying to look at flights to come home. And, uh, and she was like, why don't you go, because we're in, we're in the yeah. MGM, right? She goes, why don't you go, to, this place called Crush. She goes, why don't you go to Crush and have something to eat? And I was like, right, fine. And I took Jay and Joe to Crush and it was so fucking good. It actually changed my mood around. The food was like so fucking good. Last time we went, we had French onion soup and it was like, they put, um, I don't know what, some sort of bread or a tortilla over it. So you had to like crack the tortilla to get the soup out underneath it. Add that again, uh, add some other shit. Oh, it was fucking class. <sighs> I don't, I'm not a fan of soup. How good does soup have to be that I'm sitting here telling you how good it is, though? Like, you know what I mean? When I, when I when I when I'm hungry and I want to eat, I want to eat. Don't give me liquid food. It just I don't know. I feel like when I, I want to want something I can chew on, something I can eat. If I, I'm not trying to have a drink that's a f basically food when I'm trying to eat something more, a little bit more physical than that. Um, Danny says, <laughs> all you can eat buffets kept me alive at uni. Um, there was another one there. Liam says, how the hell does Saudi come into a European competition? Rules would need to be changed drastically for that to happen. There's other options that could be taken in my opinion. I think it is a precursor to some sort of a world super league. Like, okay. oh, you don't want a European yeah, yeah. super league? Fuck you, check this. <laughs> Especially with the likes MLS and Messi and stuff like that. I mean, they're already doing that with you know the, the Mexican league and MLS by having the, the leagues. Thing, Have we, uh, we haven't already forgot about that, innit? but the Super League situation where basically every Mate, big... that ain't gone. Every big club in Europe was literally they nailed are, on wanting to do that. They're rebranding that and trying to figure is, a different way to sell it. It's that is definitely coming back. And it's just one of those where it's... Pff, Will it have? It'll have the same reaction, but I don't know if the owners will care because it, because the likes of Juve and Barcelona and clubs like that. Everyone was into it. There, no, there no, I mean, club nah, I, mean no. I mean, they're like Barcelona, are probably the most desperate club in Europe oh, for yeah, it. Yeah. But even I mean? Juventus and, and Juve as well. Juve go, oh, we can get on this with this guaranteed money. We could get back to being Juventus again. Yeah. Uh, scroll me up a few. Uh, just back up past that last super chat because there was a couple of other comments that I thought were worth reading out there. Oh, someone said uh, Depeche says, "What served in an English buffet?" Oh, see, you could go down the Sunday dinner as an English thing, or you could do go down the, the working class English buffet, which is like smiley faces, fish fingers, <laughs> pot of beans. Um, mushy peas. I, I think you could do like, so what you do, are you Ri doing like a, a rice high class English one? Rice pudding. Because there's some top English food. Like English food gets a bad rap, but there's some fucking mega English food. Like, Especially Sunday roast. It's hard to say that when the nationals, the national dish is fish and chips. 
Yeah, or tikka masala. Tikka masala is the national, national dish, dish of England, yeah. Invented in Scotland. <laughs> I um, did not know that. Yeah. Is that true? Tikka masala. Yeah. And there's me thinking that was Indian. Well, it's it's Indian inspired, isn't it? But it's and it's like most Chinese food that you get in England, they don't can eat that in China. What do you mean? So it's Indian and inspired. So is that a bit like if I took a Chinese dish and just added a little bit of something to it, I can say, oh, it's now an English dish. Uh, maybe. I, I don't that's know basically what's been done I mean, with the tikka masala. Some guys in the comments can probably tell me, like, yeah. but I know that the Chinese food you get in England ain't the Chinese food that they're, they're selling in China. It's like, if you took reggae, reggae sauce to Jamaica, someone's gonna spit in your face, yeah? They go, it's not Jamaica food. But that's what it's kind of sold as here. Okay. It's been, see, it's, it's been made in Scotland by an Indian. All right, fair enough. I was going to say, when you said that, I was so baffled. But it's the same thing with, right, obviously, Jamaican food, you've got ackee and saltfish and mackerel is what is basically what the national dish is. But it's ackee and saltfish, if, if I remember correctly. But when you think of Jamaican food, you, you think of a rice and peas. What yeah. you think of rice uh, and peas? I think curry goat or, and, or yeah, jerk chicken. But, but rice and peas was, was apparently originated from Ghana. Right. So there's a lot of that with food, but I think Jamaica will say they've kind of adjusted it a little bit with a bit of coconut cream and et cetera, and then it becomes our dish. But I think an English, I can't think of that many good English food. Is that bad? I think because I've grown up not really eating it. I was eating Jamaican food growing up, so I don't know. But tikka masala. Oh, I did see a clip with an American. <laughs> this is always Americans, isn't it? Go Sorry. Go Someone was like, what's an American dish? And they were like, hamburgers. And they were like, okay, they're from Hamburg which is in Germany. And they're like, oh, right, uh, pizza. And they were like, that's Italian. And they're like, oh, okay, oh, Chinese food. Pizza. <laughs> no, no, no. It's pizza. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, what is it called? The, the pizza. tower. The tower, yeah. All right. So what did they say about the Chinese food? Th that was their third answer for what American, what's, what's an American dish? <laughs> Chinese and they went food. Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Fuck it up. That's brilliant. Yeah, I think you could have two. I, you can go two lanes. I think with English food, you've got we, like go very, very chappies? sort of Sunday dinnery. Yeah. Or I think you could go down the like the shit that I grew up on, like beans, beans and like turkey drummers and like, burgers, you know, I, I, burgers and shit. Like that's what it feels. Like I, feel, it I be. listen. I feel sorry for you. I feel sorry for you, but uh, Jamaican food's the best, and uh, that's non-biased. The dish is endless. See, Omar Williams is saying oxtail and rice. Not big on oxtail, you know. I'm um, I'm more rice and peas, steamed veg, curry mutton, gravy. Um, yeah, goat is. I think goat when I think curry goat. Jamaican. Yeah, it's pl it's planting, not plantain, is as well. Is also what I like. But I'm not big on. You know what? The Jamaicans that might be in the comments might not like this. A, but a pat is a, a culturalized English version of Jamaican food, or is that actually? I'm not sure. Pat is. Is that actually authentic Seth, Jamaican? It's authentic Jamaican, but obviously it would have been inspired from somewhere. But also, is it like people who liked Jamaican food saw Cornish pasties filled yeah. with Jamaican <laughs> ingredients? No, nah, because it's, it's just filled with beef. It's a beef patty, chicken patty. Are they in Jamaica though? Yeah, they are. All right. They are, and uh, but obviously a lot of the Jamaican food that I don't like is is probably the the most original part is is um is the ground food as the Jamaicans will know. So, so that's what, like I, dumplings. Someone says hamburgers out from Hamburg. Like, uh, it's kind of in the name, brother. Yeah, dumplings. <laughs> Dumplings, yam, banana, but not that kind of banana. All sorts. Callaloo. Good food, but not, but usually not the food I go yeah, for. Yeah, according to food lovers, the the hamburger comes from the seaport town of Hamburg, where it's thought that 19th century sailors brought back the idea of raw shredded beef after trading with Baltic provinces of Russia. <laughs> Hamburgs. Hamburgers aren't from Hamburg. Yeah. I feel like if you said that to a little kid, they'd be like, wait. It's like, do you French fries are from? Not from France, apparently. I think it's Belgium. Why are they called French fries? Does anyone because know? Because that was the style of the, the way they were cooked in, in France. Like, do you know Kentucky Fried Chicken? Do you know where that's from? Kentucky. Kansas. Because that was what they sold it as because it's just fried chicken when you're in Kentucky. Whereas it, over the border in Kansas, they go, oh, can we get some of that Kentucky style fried chicken? Okay. I don't know. Mm. Omar says you guys need to try jerk chicken. Me and him. Yeah. I, I think we're all right, you know. 
I'm going to be honest. I mean, I can't necessarily speak for him, but I'm going to guess and just say, I think we're okay. <laughs> I was going to say, so you're, telling a, you're telling a Jamaican man that. Hey, you should try the chicken. chicken. Joe, you're not, you won't have heard of it. You won't have heard um, of it. But check it out. What do you think? So, uh, <laughs> Deem is mob says, what drugs are you on, Ronaldo? I don't take any. I think he's told, I think he's he's upset about the fact that I didn't um I don't appreciate the the hard food which is you know like dumplings and yam and banana like the stuff that is a little bit more I quite like dumplings Jamaican uh, Buzz Rocks was a good dumpling and um, this is more the cut dumpling now I'll show you it if you've not seen it before it's more like it looks like it's cooked differently but anyway <laughs> uh, this reminds me of this conversation I had with uh, McCullough on on a it was. It, we, <laughs> Me and McCall had this 30 minutes before I watched Long One Time, thinking about a year ago, it was absolute carnage. Because we talk, <laughs> we talk about what mukbang was. Oh, yeah, people like, I mean, Janine watches that shit. Like people like- um, You watch people eat? Yeah, watching people eat. What is the fascination with mukbangs? There's, a, it, there's a lot of things that do a lot of numbers on YouTube that I don't like, get. With, with, with mukbangs, yeah. Because he didn't get it and I don't get it either. But my brother also watches it. My R Rivy's weird. Though. Yeah, but every time, every, <laughs> every, <laughs> my brother cannot eat without putting a mukbang on. What? I feel like he always puts one on, but I want to know what's people's fascination with seeing people eating, and I feel like it's, it's like some PG ASMR for people. Uh, Sam says, "Did I eat Arabic food in Jump Qatar?" Uh, I did. Yeah, did you? Um, no, I didn't have any. I think you uh, did. Yeah. I had a, little, a group of lads that took me out for a day, and um, um, yeah, we had like. We went to um, a Qatari uh, fast food restaurant where there's no seats. Like we, it was just a mm. carpet in a booth. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm all about this, man. Mm. Like, I, like, I'm not gonna go, like, oh, where's the nearest McDonald's? Like, I wanna <laughs> go and experience a place. Nah, you will, yeah, you will, yeah. I go Definitely. and experience a place. So yeah, we had that. Um, and I think we had lamb, lamb and rice mostly. But I did a similar thing when I went to, uh, when I went to Bahrain the lads took me out for the day and I just said, yeah, just do whatever. And then they told me, I mean, this, you can tell how uh, Bahrain evolved as a, as a, as a like a, a civilization mm. with one of, by what one of their dishes, obviously it's a, it's a fishing island. Um, and one of their dishes was essentially a naan bread and it was like a gritty naan bread and they were like, eat it and we'll tell you what it is afterwards. I was like, why? And they're like, cause you're not gonna eat it if we tell you. And I went, all right. So it turns out they have this uh, bread and they basically have a fish in a, a jar and it kind of ferments and they just keep shaking it up until it goes like mush and then they kind of spread that on the bread until it kind of uh, dries and cooks. Mm. So that's what the grit is. Um, and it's like a fish paste sort of bread thing. Didn't smell fishy or anything like that. I mean, I ate it. I don't think I'd go and f seek it out and say it was amazing or anything like that, but it weren't bad. And they also brought some, of, when it was a, a, a lamb skull and they, they, they was taking the meat straight off the, the skull kind of thing. You see, the problem with me is I eat with my eyes. I think a lot of people are the same. So uh, if I look at it and I'm such, I'm a picky eater and I eat with my eyes as well. When I see that shit, I'm like, nah, not for me. If, if I go I'm somewhere, I gotta go, like food's everything in it. Like I had, uh, I had the hottest curry in my life. It was in old man, it was when I was in the army and we stopped off at this service station and um, it was just literally just, there was a, a counter, like a concrete counter. There was yeah. barely any lights in the place as well. And we basically communicated through sign language. They had chickens in a, in a wooden crate behind the counter. Yeah. And we basically communicated to get some curry. And I got a pot of curry, man. It was half the size of this. It was tiny. And I was like, how's that gonna feed me, man? And it just had a bone sticking up in it with a bit of meat on the bone. And then it was like, two centimeters of curry in it. Mm. That shit was rocket fuel. Like it blew my fucking balls off. It was so spicy, yeah. so hot. It was nice though, really tender chicken. And then uh, one of my mates got the shits from it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like, I don't know, it's weird when you have like, have the shits after eating really, or like the night after, because sometimes you don't know whether it means that the food was bad or the food was great. Sometimes people get it because the food's rich, don't they? I don't really get it, mate. Like you can literally have the shits after food and it doesn't necessarily mean the food wasn't banging. Like it could actually be um, the same way people said you've enjoyed the food if you burp after it, apparently that's polite. Um, John so. says, does the Curry Mile even have the best curry spots? Um, 
there's some good curry spots in the center of town that aren't on the, the curry mile. The thing is with the, the curry mile is it, it's kind of hard to um, it's kind of hard to survive if you're shit because there's so much competition. Yeah. And if you're known for being shit, you, you might get one person come just because you're not busy and they've they've come down there because it gets. Like, if you've never been to the Curry Mile in Manchester, it's about 860 metres, by the way, yeah. just in case you're wondering, it's not actually a full mile. Um, it gets so fucking busy that the good restaurants, and I don't know the name of them, I just know where they are. Like, I've got, oh, this one here, this one on the mm. right here, the, the orange door, that's the one. They get rammed. So sometimes you go in and go, oh, 45 minutes, and you're like, oh, fuck that, I'm hungry now. And then you'll go somewhere that looks a bit quiet, and then you might not go back. So some of the ones that aren't good will get that custom. But the shit ones don't really survive. It's counterintuitive because you think, oh, there's too much competition. But actually, it's like kind of raised everyone's level a little yeah. bit because the shit ones don't survive. Um, but yeah, I mean, I haven't been recording my for a bit, you know, but it's a good spot. It's got a good spot and it's ever evolving. I feel like there's a new food store and a new food restaurant. I think the restaurants are gradually getting, some of them are getting a little bit bougie on there as well. On Curry Mile? Yeah, yeah. yeah some, of so them, some of them are like, some like of them date are, Some of them are proper swazzy, yeah, yeah. Me and Ben was talking the other day about, um, I don't know if he was here actually, we were talking about a place called Charcoal Grill that we used to go to in Oldham. And sometimes you go to a gaff and you're inside, but you're sitting on garden chairs, you know it's the bollocks mm. and what you're about to get. Now this place, shit man, it might even be 20 years ago, used to do a full hot, like Perry style chicken with chips. And I'm sure it's like a fiver. Do you remember it, Jaden? Charcoal Grill in Oldham, no. Apparently it's still there. And he heard someone going mm. about going there the other day. Um, some guy, some YouTuber has gone to go and experience it because it's, it's apparently- Probably still rate my take. The, the yeah, rate, rate my takeaway guy. Rate my take yeah, guy. so he's gone um, because he, he wanted to go check it out. That place used to bang like fuck, but it was disgusting. It was absolutely <laughs> gross, but the food was outrageous. And you know, like you go and sitting on a garden chair in a gaff, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The f and the food's gonna be outrageous. It's always the dodgiest looking place. Cause I, cause I did say on, I think the food that made me have the, the, the funniest stomach the following morning was when we, f I don't know if I should say it, when we, the food that we, f when we flew out to Qatar on the plane, that, that, the it was in business class. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so, uh, one of the best food we've ever had. <laughs> so we flew business class on Qatar Airways and I don't know whether my, my stomach or my palate was used to that level of food or that level of cooking, it went straight through me. Might as well, might as well have been laxative on the plate, I swear to God. Like then, on the plane and the day after, <laughs> and I said to my mum, like, it's been day one and I'm already shitting myself. And she's like, what happened? I feel like it's the food um, on the Qatar plane in business, business class, I think it was too good. Do you know what I mean? Like just the way it's made, I'm not used to that kind of cooking. Was it a pie? Big... Nah, it was, um, it was just, it was food that wasn't too mad, but it was just the way it was made. It I just forgot what we had because I did so many yeah. flights out there back and forward to, to Dubai. Yeah. Um, to go see Uncle Pat. Um, yeah. I forgot what was on what flight. <laughs> nah, I don't. I think I've got, I've got pictures of it. I took pictures, but it's different, different over there. Um, the kid's back says spicy tink. Uh, Theo mm. says Jamaican food is like Caribbean food from Northeast of the US. Where's that like Maine, New York kind of uh, Creole no, food, no. Jamaican food is awful. Oh. <laughs> uh, Daniel Berry says airplane food is not too rich. Jama business class Jamaican on don't know seasoning on their food. Phil, where are you from, mate? Where are you from, Turduck? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> uh, Ridwan says charcoal grill in Oldham, they've renovated it recently. Is it not garden chairs no more? Is it yeah. now indoor chairs? It used to be rammed, and it was the food was ten out of ten. Like honestly, if someone had put that in the Gordon Ramsay place, you'd have been like, "Yo," but it was a fiver, and it was served on garden furniture. It yeah. used to go regular. Nah, I get you, but I'm I'm just more tripped out for for. All I'm gonna say is yeah, I, that's obviously bait. There's say, no one, there's no one in the world thinks Jamaicans don't know food. Don't know seen it seasoned on their yeah, food. There's, that, there's that's no one up. in the world thinks you from Suriname. You from Suriname? <laughs> for Suriname, I mean, sorry. All right. Um, scroll up a little bit. Scroll up. Romanticizing food. What's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, 
uh, the parking there, forget about it. Oh yeah, Curry Miles, forget about parking there. Not <laughs> says, restaurants have to compete with each other in places like Curry Miles, so have to be a good standard. Yeah, you might get a, a new gaff open. That's, that's not good. Yeah, yeah. But they don't survive. They don't survive. It is one of those, like if you do like Indian food, um, or actually Middle Eastern food in general, because you do get like Bangladeshi, Pakistani, you get like a lot of different um, Asian food over there. So you can't just call it Indian food. That'd be, that'd be sort of underselling what you get there. Yeah. There's a lot of Lebanese that you get out there, Moroccan. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's kind of a, a lot of different flavors flying around <laughs> over there. You'll find something that you like. Um, in fact, I might have to go this weekend, you know, because I ain't been in a minute. Yeah, I, I feel, like you got, feel like you got to reignite yeah. the palate a little bit. I think we're going for a curry. It's Janine's brother's birthday today. I think we're going for a curry tomorrow. Uh, okay. So going more on Saturday might be a bit, bit much. Um, but yeah. Uh, John says, Manchester's a melting pot. I love that about it. It is. Like, you know you can go to different parts of the city and know you're going to get a different, like, different sorts of food. Yeah, it's, it's Manchester's very, very diverse. It is very diverse. It's a great mix. It's, it's like um, it's got a, it's got a London type, not quite extreme of a London diversity, but not far off. Yeah, I think yeah. it's just easier to walk across than, yeah, yeah, than London. Uh, yeah, I think you, that's the one thing is like um, Americans sort of shit on English food, and I don't know if they're just talking about you know what people have for our teas, maybe, mm. um, but what are Americans having for the tea? Yeah. Like, um, but I think English restaurant food, like I would say. Pound for pound, Manchester was better than anywhere. Pound for pound. Like, San Diego was very good. But San Diego was only as good as Manchester for food. Yeah. I would say. Well, that Kettner Exchange was good. Kettner Exchange was good. What did I have? I had, like tuna on rice or something. Like yeah. That. that was fucking well good. It, See, Sean says it there. English food is average. But, like, are, are you talking, like, English... In, what's the, the stereotypical English food? Because... Like Jamaican restaurants and Indian restaurants, that's restaurants that you get in England. That's what most people, um, that's what most people mm. are eating. Like what's an English, what's English food? I don't know. I what's an English restaurant? Like Chris Butty? Like. <laughs> I mean, cause culturally just England, I think it's, it's got so many cultures inside it. It's just foods be become just everything, everywhere. Shane says, how's Dublin food or Belfast? I don't think, what the fuck I ate in Dublin actually? Um, I didn't really have any sort of sit-down scram in Dublin. Guinness punch. <laughs> I had a takeaway pizza the night we went out. I, I can't comment on Dublin food, actually. Uh, Always Wrong says, you need to go to the real Mexican food spots in San Diego. You've been mind blown. We did. Like, we got, we no, got we did. taken to one, like, we're, what, 20 foot from the fucking border? Yeah, we did. Oh, but we just, we're just careful with how close to the San Diego border we actually went. For, for obvious reasons. Um, reasons that I didn't know about that like Steve tried to explain to me. Uh, yeah. Greg's, yeah, I mean, are, do, are people looking at Greg's and going, oh my God, is that English food? But no one's going out for Greg's. Greg's is an on the move food. I'm trying to think, there's, there's a, cause Greg's, you can have about seven Greg's in the space of two miles in some, some places in Manchester, I feel like. Seven? <laughs> There's about four on Piccadilly. Yeah, there is uh, like uh, there's a, there's a Greg's and you walk a minute a minute down there's a Greg's and then then there's that one that you always miss in between two vape shops. Then there's one inside. There's a fucking Greg's. There then as there's well. one just inside the Arndale. But there's, well. there's one just before the Halifax Bank over there as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, on How many Greg's is there in Manchester, Drek? I don't know, but there, there's meant to be a place because it's like there's one place in England that has more prep than Greg's, and it's the only place in England that does. Reeks of Shropshire. Hmm. Okay, I, I, it's not Burnley, put it that way. <laughs> Not sure it is. Oh, jeez. There's anyway, one opposite anyway. Aldi in the Arndale. There is, <laughs> Jeff says, what is Greg's? I don't know how you would explain Greg's to someone. Um, it's a national store of England. Greg sells baked goods. So it sells bread, weirdly. It does actually sell nah, sliced bread. I will give Greg's credit. I think over the years, Greg's has become a little bit more... It's expanded its arrival. Oh shit, I didn't realise what time it was. Yeah, it was <laughs> um, so Greg sells, th is the oh, staples from Greg's. Pasties, so they do a steak bake, they do a, uh, a cheese and bean one, they do the a cheese and, and bean one. one's good. Good for um, the bowels then. 
the sausage roll that they do yeah. will change your life. It's fucking outrageous. Basically, if you, if you're a toddler in England, Greg's is going to be one of your free meals for the day. Um, yeah, it's all of those. Um, yeah. Anyway, I think I need to go because the missus is texting me. I didn't realise what time it was. Cheers for tuning in. Get your thoughts on food and everything else, I guess, in the comments. And I'll see you in a bit. See you later. A little bit of extra content, a Discord group, meetups, five aside games, weekly podcasts, behind the scenes, and even an occasional bit of transfer news as and when I get it. Then, for the price of a pint, you can show your appreciation for the content that we make and get some.